We were two liberal arts graduates, had neither of us had ever farmed. We chose a region that was totally untested, Oregon, and we chose a grape that had never done well in the United States. So I think the fact that we're still here says something um, about how Oregon was made for Pinot Noir. The system that we set up of working together out of necessity, which um, we then shared with virtually the entire world, in which we shared how we make Pinot and what we were trying to do as we made Pinot. And I don't know of any other variety of grape that can give you that surprise, but also that degree of pleasure. So uh, that's why even young people coming to Oregon now, they have this real drive to make the great Pinot Noir. It's the, it's the, uh, the ultimate in winemaking. For many of us, Pinot Noir is the gold standard. It is the holy grail of winemaking. And we will always keep up the quest to make this wine better. And that's the whole idea with planting Pinot Noir here, is to retain the sort of ephemeral varietal characteristic of Pinot Noir. I think that passion is a word that's been kind of co-opted by the marketing department. And so uh, for me, I'll just keep it at love. So in 1961, my father took his first trip to the West Coast and his distributor, who was selling the few of the Drouin Burgundy wines, said, Robert, we should do the drive all the way to Oregon. It's beautiful, you will love it. So they did, they, they drove up the coast, uh, California, and then ended up in Oregon. And my father was so surprised how similar the valley was to Burgundy. Maybe thought, might be a place for, for Pinot Noir here, but didn't think one second that he would make wine. Much later, 1979, there's a big tasting in Paris, and a wine from David Lett wins the tasting. Big, everyone was so surprised, including my father. We were like a, a bunch of soldiers in a foxhole that knew that if we all hung together and helped each other, we could do great things. The number one challenge was we weren't sure we were planting the right varietals in the right place, uh, in the right region, let alone knowing what particular uh, sites would be best for Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, or anything. That was a real challenge. When I arrived in 74, the university had just put out a brochure telling all the farmers that you couldn't grow vinifera grapes in the Willamette Valley. In order to make great Pinot Noir, you have to match the climatic conditions that it requires. Those of us that planted Pinot Noir back in the 60s here in Oregon really were looking for the right climate to match that variety. Well, it used to be that, you know, what's that guy down the street doing? He's growing wine grapes in Oregon? You can't do that. We'll send him over to the mental hospital. <laughs> I'm from Texas, and I grew up in Texas, and I was, I considered myself one of the luckiest guys in the world. What's beautiful about this place is it has the vibrancy of fruit that you, that one might associate with, you know, the new world, uh, you know, this young, vibrant region, which is our Willamette Valley, but it, uh, underlying that, it has that sense of place and that sense of soil uh, that adds a mineral quality a rockiness to the structure of our Pinot Noir that, that just makes it zing and come alive with food and with age. And we really do live and work on the margins of viticulture here. And if we don't do everything right in the vineyard, uh, we don't succeed in the winery. We have to be very careful all year. And it's, it's sort of like going to war in October here every year. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's what gets the blood up in the morning and gets a 66-year-old man out of bed, you know. <laughs> uh, when winter happens in Oregon, it's like somebody has pulled a switch. The rains start, the birds come in, uh, 
the mildew starts growing, the botrytis uh, can kick up. And so these are all the factors that you're sort of um, fighting in the vineyard uh, or, 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 or praying against uh, during harvest. I think that when you talk to other folks that grow uh, and make wine from other varieties, uh, I think if they were making Pinot Noir, they would miss out, miss, they would miss all the tricks they could do in the winery because those tricks just don't work. You truly are just reflecting the quality of what you get in the vineyard. And then on top of all that, there's the actual winemaking and what happens in that particular place. I'm giving myself expression. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm allowing it to be what the grape is and in and, and the simplest form. I'm bringing it in. I'm not altering it in any way. I'm not adding adding my yeast to my pinots anymore. I'm, I'm really letting the, the grape express itself. You know that 2004 is gonna be different than 2005, it's gonna be different than 2006. It's a lie. And really what we're giving you as winemakers is that piece of history. You're drinking 2004 and you're drinking our interpretation of 2004. So I think Oregon is a convergence of many things. You know, it's a convergence of a specific climate, um, a specific geography, specific soil types, and then also potentially a, a specific character of person. Um, there's a lot of free-spiritedness here, I would say, and you know, pioneering spirit and independence of thought, and that kind of goes right along with making Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir is so independent in and of itself. from David Lett all the way through right next door, Ken Wright, and uh, helping out some of the new people. There's a, a chain that's formed, uh, a, everybody being a link in that chain of sharing what they have learned and having that camaraderie. Back in those days, 30 years ago, a lot of Americans didn't know what Pinot Noir was. And we had to really establish the fact that it was not Cabernet. That was the mantra of the first international Pinot Noir celebrations. And we've learned over the years it not only really works, it's also a whole lot more fun than going it alone. And the success is a result. Again, back to the Oregon character, the sort of bullheadedness, tenacity, and pioneering spirit. There are, of course, 12 things that you can be certified in. You know, there are lots of different sustainable type certifications, whether it's Demeter or organic or salmon safe or live. Um, I think a lot of people think about it. I think it's part of the consciousness, and I think that will just continue. The more people see that it's, that you can be successful as a wine producer and a wine grower and also as a business and still practice sustainability, more and more people will do it. All we're doing is a version of what had been done before. I mean, we had sustainability and then we moved into kind of this mechanical age and, you know, commercial fertilizer was cheaper and tractors were cheaper and, you know, it was easier to mechanize and now we're finding out that that really isn't the necessary, the best thing for the vines and the, the wine. And we're kind of going back full circle to where we were before. Not just uh, sustaining the soil and making the soil better at, when we leave and the wines better, but it's also a people process. And um, we, we try to, uh, to call it sustainability for our people as well as our land and our wines. Here in Oregon, almost 20 years ago, we came up with a program to provide health care services for our vineyard workers and their families. We call it Salud to Your Health, and we provide clinics, dental care, and even an alcohol nurse for these families. We reach almost 4,000 people each year and keep hundreds out of the emergency rooms. This is something we're very proud of, and it's a first for the whole country. As an industry, we continue to innovate in, in different areas, um, from viticultural techniques that are used throughout the world, um, or clonal material that we're bringing in specifically for our region. And I think uh, the goal, the paramount goal for our generation as well as future generations is, is to continue that innovation, uh, continue to enhance the quality of Pinot Noir and do so well respecting our land. We've inherited a really incredible thing that we need to not screw up, really is what it is and we've been given really beautiful wines and a really beautiful place and a really wonderful region 
And it's our job, it's our responsibility, is every generation improving on the generation before it.